My name is uh, João Neves. I work as a software engineer at uh, OutSystems. Uh, how many of you heard of OutSystems? Raise your hands. OK. That's cool. Uh, so uh, OutSystems, for the ones that don't know OutSystems, uh, we have this, this platform. I'm going to show a quick demo of it. OK. So uh, we have this uh, platform. Uh, it has an IDE where you drag and drop things around uh, logic. You build the logic. You build uh, your screens. You build your data model. And then everything is packed into an application and ready to be deployed into a web server within seconds. OK? Um, if you guys want to know more about out systems, please drop by our booth outside. Okay, we'll be there uh, doing some live demos. Uh, last time I was in, in CodeBits, I presented this. I'm going to show you. Okay. So I presented this, okay. This is a Lego Mindstorms robot, uh, and it has a Nerf gun on top of it. Uh, it was controlled with uh, a mobile application. We used out systems for that. Um, but uh, this is the result, okay? So people would go to the application and press fire, and the robot will, would then uh, fire a Nerf bullet. But you know, uh, well, thing, things didn't work that, uh, that well. And uh, accidents happen, OK? So uh, CodeBeats had to change its name. We had to wait two more years for another event. And guys, I'm sorry for that, OK? Uh, so this time, I'll skip the, the demos, any moving parts. And uh, I'm going to talk about React and my experience with it. Um, how many of you uh, know React uh, or Develop with uh, React. Okay, some guys. So, my journey with React started uh, two years ago. Uh, we started two years ago uh, developing the new platform version uh, that we just launched launched uh, yesterday. Um, but two years ago, React wasn't as sexy as it is today. Okay, so React was just a small framework uh, and not as popular as it is today. Zero. This is the number of React apps that I delivered in the last two years. So you guys might be wondering why is this guy on stage here talking about React. Uh, well, you know, in order to, to create a platform that heavily uses, uses uh, React, you have to know how React works and go in the inner workings of React to, to squeeze most of it, most of the perf performance out of, out of it. I'm going to start with the basics, with the basics, OK? I'm going to do 101 uh, and tell you uh, how, React, how React works. For the ones that already know React, please don't, don't leave yet, OK? It's going to be quick. This is the core premise of React, OK? Render the whole app in every update. Uh, so you don't have to worry about uh, from going to state A to state B. You just tell React, OK, this is what I want from my, uh, for my application. So in React, you take your properties and state, and you render a tree of components. Re remember, you don't have to. Uh, to take care about state transitions. It's, you can think of it just as plain functions, OK? This is what a component looks like in, in React. Uh, in this case, I'm using ES6 uh, classes syntax. Uh, and you, as you can see, you have the render method that uses properties uh, to produce a tree of components. Uh, it's, well, this is the basics, and it's, it's look, it looks uh, simple, right? 
after the render, uh, React will combine all the trees of components and produce what they call the, vir the virtual DOM. You can think of the virtual DOM as a simple descriptor of a DOM subtree rendered, rendered in, the, in the browser. Uh, this is basically a parallel representation of, Rea uh, of the, the DOM and allows React to uh, avoid creating DOM nodes, accessing DOM, the existing DOM nodes, which is typically slower than uh, manipulating just plain uh, JavaScript objects. And this representation also allows React to perform some batch updates on DOM uh, and Using batch, uh, uh, batch uh, updates, it's good because you can avoid uh, things such as layout trashing. Um, so in this case, uh, we, have a, uh, we want to update a node, remove another, uh, another node, and add a, a subtree of nodes. React will gather all those updates and uh, update the DOM tree uh, just uh, in one shot. But generating uh, the minimum number of operations uh, to transform in one virtual uh, uh, DOM tree into another, it's a very com complex problem. Even with the best known algorithms, it would take more than one second to, uh, we, well, with current computation power, uh, to uh, display those 1,000 elements. And, uh, well, you know, we cannot uh, afford that. We don't have time for that. So, in order, in order to speed up things, React makes some shortcuts when comparing the, the trees. First, uh, if... Um, if both components have the same type, uh, React will assume that they generate similar trees and will try to compare them. But if they have different types, we, React will discard right away the, the old uh, subtree and render the new one from scratch. So React won't compare oranges with apples. What about adding new elements to the, to the tree? Well, if we do it at the end, there's no problem. It's uh, just a simple addition, OK? But, but if we add elements in the middle, uh, React will have to know uh, how to identify the elements, OK? So React needs to know, OK, this element was present before or not. And to do that, uh, you have to provide unique keys that are stable across uh, renders, OK? And those keys will, have, will help React matching the, the components and speed up the, the, the diffing task. And in fact, if you don't provide those keys, React will complain about that. Well, React knows now to update uh, the UI when it's more appropriate. So, one advice that I give you is let him do all the work. Uh, but this is what, I, what it happens if you try to mess the DOM somehow. There are plenty of ways to, to, to mess with the DOM. You can use document, query, selectors. Uh, you can uh, insert nodes, jQuery, whatever you want. But uh, you should always remember this simple rule. Avoid interacting with the DOM, OK? Uh, because if you do it bef before time, you might force the browser to recalculate all the layout, all the styles, and those are usually very expensive tasks. But if you really have to, uh, to, to manipulate a DOM, there are some lifecycle methods that React provides you, uh, such as the component did mount and component did, did update, uh, that allows you... Uh, which, which are basically safe places to, to play with the, with the DOM. But again, play safe with the DOM or you will have a, a bad time. So this is the end of the fairy tale. Let's talk, now let's talk about problems and challenges. Um, every app has a list. Facebook, uh, Gmail, Twitter, LinkedIn, you name it, okay? 
And lists typically impose uh, great challenges, as it is very easy to get past the thousands of HTML element, elements. For instance, if you, when you open your Facebook wall page, um, the browser will display almost 3,000 uh, HTML elements. And once you start scrolling the news feed, uh, you, can reach, you can easily reach the 10,000 the 10, elements. And as you can see, we, we have a problem there. That, that's a lot of elements uh, for React to, to compare. Um, and as I, t as I told you, keys would certainly, in this case, in the case of um, of lists, keys would be uh, would be um, would certainly help uh, matching the, the all the posts. But if we're updating all the UI, we also might want to skip some parts of uh, the rendering uh, rendering some parts of the screen that that didn't change too. So I introduce you the should component update. Should component update is a lifecycle method provided by React. Uh, it's basically a function that it is invoked before the rendering process starts and gives the developer the ability to uh, basically short circuit the, 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 the old process. Keep in mind that this function will be, will be called uh, pretty often, so the implementation should be should be fast. And uh, at this point, we usually look at the properties and the state, and uh, if React and the, if they are the same, we just tell okay, React, don't render this component, and React won't render the component and all the its descendants. So th this is basically a shortcut that you, that you have. Let's take a look at this component. Th it's a user card that displays a user and age. Uh, so you have there the shoot component update implementation. By the way, you can replace that implementation with a mix-in that uh, comes with uh, React. Okay? Basically, what it does is uh, performs a shallow comparison of properties and state for you, so you don't have to care about all the properties and uh, all the state that you have on the component. Now, I have some data. I, I uh, render the, the component with that data. And uh, I do this, OK? One year later, I change the user age. And then I render again. Can you see? Can you see the problem with this? Okay. Since props uh, and uh, next props, uh, look at the. I'm now looking at the shoot component update. Since props and next props uh, reference the same object, this, compar this comparison won't uh, work properly uh, because we would be comparing the, the, the same object, and we would miss the actual uh, property change. Uh, you know, looks like we invented this anti-aging React component, OK? For me, it's OK. I don't mind uh, living forever with 30 years. But OK, this is not what I want, OK? I'm not happy with it. So introducing you immutable. You probably heard uh, Nick's presentation uh, two presentations ago uh, about immutables, OK? Um, React recommends the use of immutable JS, which is a, li a library that, they, that uh, it's also developed by Facebook. And this library uh, draws inspiration from some uh, persistent da data structures from functional programming languages such as uh, Scala or Haskell. Um, and let me show you how we can uh, use immutable records in the context of React. Okay, so instead of having a plain JavaScript object, I have this uh, user uh, immutable record. Uh, and notice that I changed 
the, 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 the age uh, set with the, 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 the set method of the, the mutable record. And uh, once I do that, I get a copy of the user. So we never change existing objects. We all, when we change an, uh, an immutable record, we get a new copy. And we never, change the, we never actually change the original uh, one. And uh, well, in this case, if we're not changing the original one, once I render the, the component, we will have two instances of the object, the previous, the previous uh, state of the object and the next state of the object. And once you compare, you will see the, uh, you'll get the, the differences. Uh, during uh, the, the development of the, the platform, we, we had some trouble, troubles with the current implementation of immutable records. We did some, uh, we did some, um, we, we ended up creating our, uh, our, our implementation of immutable records uh, because, well, we, we knew we had, we took advantage of some prior knowledge that we, that we have about data structures on in out systems uh, applications. But I'm not going to dive in, into details here. Uh, that's a subject for another, another talk. OK. How do we know which components should implement should component update? Fortunately, React comes with uh, nice tools to, to help you identify which components should, uh, which components take re uh, longer to, to render and find good candidates to have a should component update implementation. Uh, these tools come as an add-on, OK? So you have to, you have, to have uh, the development build of, of React in order to use these perf tools. Um, so basically, you require that, that perf add-on. And once you, you have it, you call start on the perf module. You interact with your application, uh, let it uh, do render, OK? And then you call stop. And after that, you have a bunch of operations that you can call. But the, uh, print wasted is the most uh, um, important one um, which I think is the most important one. And uh, Print Wasted will basically give you information about the components that return the same uh, tree. OK, so you gave them properties and state, and they, uh, and they return the same uh, tree. So we are, uh, React adds to re-render the same tree again. And that's not, uh, so we're, wasting uh, uh, time here. So those that always render the same and took more time are good candidates to have a, a, a shoot component update. You see those names there? Uh, if you want to, let me just give you a small tip. If you want to have good names there, you just place uh, a static uh, field uh, name display name on your component, and you'll get those names on the on the on that table and uh, precision precision okay um, we use these tools a lot in the, in the development process and after looking at the numbers we saw uh, that we still had many components that were wasting time because they were always rending the, the, the same tree because we have an annihilate uh, composable UI model, uh, this introduces some, some challenges, OK? Uh, look at this in example. We have the, the, exp uh, the expensive render component, uh, which has a placeholder. And we can put anything inside the, the, the placeholder. So we don't know the, the, the children beforehand. We don't know. Uh, them, we don't know their properties, we don't know nothing about them. So, uh, creating a shoot component on the expensive render component would be a, a tough task. Well, we solved that problem introducing a special property that we call dependencies, okay? Uh, all the, all the, the, everything that the expensive render component has to do is to Look at this um, at this dependency property, dependencies property, and compare uh, the properties that you give. This is basically an array of properties that some of its children would will have. But 
as you can imagine, sorting these things by hand uh, would be boring and error prone. Fortunately, we uh, developed and introduced an automatic mechanism uh, in the OutSystems platform compiler, which collects all the, 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 the dependencies and, and uh, it's able to, uh, without any developer intervention, okay? So we want this to be as easy as, as possible. And without any developer intervention, it collects all the dependencies and, uh, and uh, uh, puts the dependencies in place uh, for, for you. Uh, but we don't do this for every component. If we, if we did, it would be, uh, it could, it could be, it could int introduce, introduce some performance problems. Uh, we, only, uh, we only do this for the most uh, complex uh, components. Virtual, virtualization, okay? So, we have this dependency property, solved most of our problems, but lists are still a big, a big problem. Render times tend to grow as the data set grows. And when you have infinite scroll patterns, uh, we started eating some uh, out of memory problems. So we knew that we had to find uh, some kind of virtualization uh, uh, solution. You know, browsers already do some, some rendering optimizations. They skip the render of, some, of the regions that are outside of the viewport. But that's not enough, okay? Uh, because you have you still have to, to have in memory all the DOM, all the virtual DOM from React, all the, compon the component state, everything would live in memory. And we would like to discard all that and only render what's visible on the screen. Well, I don't like to, to, to reinvent the wheel, but you know, sometimes you, you have to. So first, I googled for some existing solutions, but I didn't find any solution that would fulfill my, my requirements. And my requirements were no extra HTML elements, OK? So I don't want that when I enable virtualization on some list or some component, I don't want any extra divs, any extra HTML elements. Second. It has to support variable list item sizes. Most of the, the solutions that I found on the internet uh, require that you specify the, the, the height of the list beforehand. And uh, we're building a platform, and we don't want to show that complexity to our users. So it's, it's important that we try to figure out by our, ourselves what's the height of the list. And last, we had to support animations, OK? We want uh, items to enter with an animation and live with an, uh, some animation. So it has to support that. So we went to our own implementation. Uh, first of all, we have to listen for the scroll events on the container that has the, the, the scroll behavior and uh, remove the items that, as they go out of view, the viewport. And when they enter in the viewport, we render those, uh, those uh, uh, items. And for instance, if you have a list with 1,000 items and only 20 fit on the viewport, you will render only those uh, uh, 20, OK? But uh, because we want performance and we don't want some bl blank spaces to appear, we also render some extra uh, uh, items ar around the viewport so that they are already there when once you stra start scrolling. OK, so how does this thing work? OK, as we scroll and the items on top disappear, we have to compensate the, the, the height of the elements, um, the height of the elements the, with the, the corresponding blank space, OK? Uh, as if, uh, let's pretend that the elements were there. We also, we also have to compensate the height uh, after the last rendered element uh, so that the scroll bars uh, work uh, OK. So our first approach was to wrap all the items with a div. 
and play with the margins and paddings. But, well, you know, this wouldn't work for bulleted lists. On bulleted lists, you have UL and LE tags inside the UL tag, and you cannot have a div tag around the LE tags. Otherwise, you would generate invalid uh, markup. Uh, so we added, we, we want to add a spacer here. Um, you know, it turns out we can place script elements there, OK? If you look at the specs, you'll find that UL uh, elements accept LEs and script tags. And the best part of it, it's valid HTML. OK? We're getting into a point. Yes. Script tags are not visible, and they do, don't occupy space. But you know, that's just browser defaults. You can make them visible. All you have to do is change their display and give them some, some, some dimensions. And for the best part, browsers behave nice with this, OK? OK, so what about scrolling? If the items have the same height, scrolling would be a trivial task. When you scroll down, remove all the items on the top uh, that went out of the, the viewport, and you increase the top spacer height with the aggregated size of the items that uh, left. But scrolling up, it's a more complicated uh, task, because you don't know, you discarded th those items, and you don't know their sizes, uh, uh, the, the sizes of the items that are entering. So to make an educated guess, we keep an updated average of the item's height, and we calculate the number of items that we think would uh, enter the viewport in the next uh, scroll. Uh, this, way, this way, we will have a, a scroll that, that doesn't jump, and it, it, it's smooth. Well, but rendering this, uh, all the, only the visible items requires accessing the DOM to obtain information about item size, uh, scroll information about scroll top, scroll left, etc. Uh, and uh, we cannot do that on the renders function, OK? So as I told you before, do try not avoid to mess with the DOM on the render. Otherwise, we would be violating React uh, best practices, and we will have uh, lay out uh, thrashing problems. So let's, let's follow the way, uh, let's follow the React way of doing things. And whenever scroll changes, we do all the math, the math that requires accessing the browser, OK? Then we store that information uh, on the state of the, the, the component. And that would, uh, once we set the state, that will trigger a render. After all this complex work, uh, of the most complex work is done, render just simply uh, pick, picks up the items that it has to render and uh, returns them. But what happens if we immediately react uh, to any scroll changes? Well, we might end up doing much work uh, that probably will be discarded. And on slower devices, we won't have a, a, a smooth scroll. So let me introduce you a request animation frame. Uh, I'm a big fan of request animation frame, by the way. Um, it's a browser API that receives a callback. Uh, and that callback is invoked before the next, uh, the next repaint. It's very, it's very useful. So every time we receive a scroll change, um, we do a request animation frame, and we say to the browser, OK, on next paint, please do this work. Uh, but we do only do that if there's no pending uh, request animation frame. Otherwise, we would get uh, two or more pending. Uh, we, we would be handling uh, more than one event. So the, the, this handle scroll function will only run at the end of the, the, current, the current frame. 
when the, when the browser is about to, to repaint. <clears throat> okay, so we've, we're done with scroll. One last thing, animations. Uh, once, once we turned animations on, all items that were entering and leaving the viewport as we scrolled, and they were entering and leaving because we were removing and adding them because of virtualization, they kept animating. And it wasn't a behavior that we, that, that we wanted. Uh, we only want those items to uh, animate once we, the, the user removes, really removes the, the item or adds the item. So we took inspiration from React uh, CSS transition group, which is basically an add-on component for creating animations for creating animations that it uh, provides uh, by React. And we took inspiration from that component and made a component that it's able to suspend animations. So basically, while, while we are scrolling, we, we suspend all the animations on the, the list items. This way, we can scroll and the items won't, uh, won't animate because of virtualization. What about animating size? We want elements to, when they appear, they start with uh, a height zero, okay, and they uh, go up to their their height, okay. Um, but you you know that that's not a trivial task to to do in uh, in HTML. So let me explain uh, how we did that. Uh, so we, we wanted to animate list, and list items as they entered, uh, but we don't know their size beforehand. So we cannot animate a size property, and, and sorry, because we cannot an animate a size property from zero to an auto value, we have to figure out what the, the, the height that the element is going to have. So once the, the element enters, we will inspect the element's height, OK, and store that on a variable. Then we apply the enter class that will basically give uh, height 0 to, to, to the element. OK, so we are in the first stage of animation. After one uh, frame, uh, because you have to, to apply that, those changes, after one uh, paint, uh, one uh, render frame, you apply the active class. And once you apply the active class, you set the, L, the, the, the inline style. In this case, we set the height using the inline style of the element with the height that we started before. And because the, the enter active class already has the, the, the transition things, the, the transition CSS properties, uh, and because we're changing a property, the item will start to, to animate. And then the, the animation runs. And at the end, we just clear the, that inline style, and it's a win. And we took uh, our component that we, al we already built for, uh, uh, for virtualization and extended that to also co accomplish uh, this. All, the, all these components are available on my GitHub. You can uh, check it out and fork it and con contribute it. Okay, uh, you're welcome. Okay, so let's talk about uh, screen transitions. Um, we're using React Router to handle uh, all the transitions between screens and give uh, those transitions a native look like. Uh, but we started no noticing some jank on more complex screens. When we have more complex screens, we saw that the screens didn't uh, properly uh, slide uh, as smooth as we wanted. Chrome DevTools are great, great, uh, uh, are great tools to uh, to spot these these problems. And we found that we had many frames, uh, many long frames during the, the transition. Uh, you can spot that uh, just by looking at the, the reds on top of the, the timeline. 
the, the green chart, it's basically the frames per second that you have on your, uh, on your uh, page. So the problem is that we're doing a lot of work uh, to prepare the new screen during the transitions. And these animations also required CPU uh, because well, probably they, they have to do some layout stuff and all of that uh, occurs on the, on the main thread. And as you can notice, the GPU thread is almost idle, which means animations are not using the, the, the GPU, and probably we're missing something here. So this is the CSS we got for uh, making transitions work. And notice that we're using transforms, as everyone says. Transforms are, are, are good. They are, uh, they, are GPU, uh, they are handled by the GPU. And uh, well, but in this case, it turns out uh, it wasn't okay. Um, but a small, a small change on the CSS did the trick. We basically changed the transform, so we're sliding one sc uh, the screen uh, left, uh, and we had a percentage to to make that translation happen. We changed that with viewport units. And you know, well, it worked perfectly. Um, and, and now we can run a JavaScript on the main thread while the anim animations are running without compromising the, the whole experience. So in this case, we have some kind of parallelism that we can, that, that we can take advantage of. Uh, Fading transitions were also a problem. Uh, this, is, this is the CSS that uh, we had for fading transitions. Uh, and this, in this case, we were simply changing the, the opacity of the elements. And uh, there was some jank too. And once we had the will change property and said to the browser, OK, this property will change, this, uh, this element will change its opacity. Uh, everything uh, worked perfectly. Basically, will change gives an in to the browser uh, so that the browser can perform some optimizations ahead of time. Uh, sometimes it, what will, uh, the browser will do is create a new layer and uh, uh, render, in this case, would render that element in a new layer. So, so all you have to do is compose it, the two layers uh, together instead of branding the whole layer, uh, doing all the layout stuff, and, and uh, um, that would be much, uh, much worse in terms of uh, performance. But uh, guys, uh, be careful applying this, this property, OK? Uh, this, this property uh, wastes and uses many uh, machine resources, and you should you should choose it uh, carefully. The, the elements that you you the elements that will have this this property applied. Otherwise, you may, might end up without resources, or uh, your transitions would wouldn't be that slow, that uh, smooth. Okay, so uh, almost at the end, there are gonna be three more talks. Uh, from my colleagues uh, from Out Systems, uh, Lara and Rita will gonna present uh, how to build a, a, a Pokédex using Out Systems. It's gonna be a fun and very, uh, very good uh, talk. Uh, Miguel Ventura is gonna talk about TypeScript and how we internally use it. We we are heavy users of uh, TypeScript at Out Systems. So Andy is going to talk about that and what TypeScript gives you uh, in terms of goodies for, for developers. And uh, last but not least, uh, Diogo and Sergio will talk about continuous integration and uh, what we do uh, around continuous integration inside out systems. You can also check on our uh, engineering blog. We have all these subjects and much more. Uh, basically, when we find something that's in interesting to tell, uh, to tell to the community, we write their uh, blog post. 
You can also check on our GitHub. We have several uh, um, several open source projects there. And if you want to know more about OutSystems, go to our website and try our our product. So this is the the questions part. I'll try to answer. Not granted. Hello. Uh, Hello. Great, great work, by the way. I uh, just have one question. How do you handle find? Sorry? How do you handle the find? Sorry. How do you handle find? So basically, that means that imagine that you know that on that list, yeah, there is a, an element with the name João. Yeah. But it's not on the viewport. Yeah. How do you handle that? But uh, how do you handle in terms of what? Uh, well, I'll go size? On, no, on the browser, I'll go find. I type João. Uh, okay. And it's not on a viewport. Yeah. Well, we simply don't, okay? Um, we did this for mobile devices. That's not a problem in mobile devices because. Basic, first of all, basically, we have, uh, uh, we're using an hybrid approach. So there's no uh, browser goodies uh, around uh, in the mobile uh, application. So uh, we don't have that, that problem, OK? But uh, if you use search on the application, if you have a search filter on the application, that wouldn't be a problem. No more questions? Okay. Thank you.